Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Thinker Nick podcast. I'm Nick Daniels and it is quarter to 11 in the morning here in Vietnam. I'm joined by Nicola Tyler. How are we doing? Fantastic. Thanks, That's Nick. That's good. That's good. Very early I feel early like in the, morning the early here. bird didn't catch the worm this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why is that? A busy week, but okay. a good week. Yeah, fantastic yes. week. And now you get but, to chat uh, you've to me. Definitely got, yeah, you've definitely got me up before my brain cells follow. I'm hoping <laughs> that they follow. <laughs> well, hopefully. I can't guarantee that. Yeah, hopefully this podcast will get your brains firing. I hope so. Right. I hope so too. Alrighty. And same for the mm -hmm. listeners. So what we're going to dive into today is the importance of having a mentor. Okay. And mm -hmm. we're going to focus on three main things and that's kind of the history or the uh, the what what is a mentor the purpose which is why so why do you think it's important to have a mentor and then the process of how to acquire a mentor so the first question i'm going to pose to you nicola is just looking at the history of a mentor what is a mentor great i love this topic because it was actually the first topic i ever presented on at a conference, I think it was in 1990, a long time ago. And mentor is actually a person. In Greek mythology, mentor was asked by Odysseus to look after his son. I think it was called Telemachus, when Odysseus went to war. So basically Odysseus said to mentor his friend, would you be a guide for life for my son. So it's almost got uh, origins in what you might call being a godparent, where you sort of provide guidance for life in the event that a parent passes. So it's got very deep roots in terms of its history. But then something interesting happened. And, you know, I think over the years, people read Greek mythology and learn about this. And then in the 1960s, something was introduced to America called affirmative action. And what they wanted to do it was more popular in the 70s, but they sort of started to play with it, I believe, in the 60s. And in affirmative action, what they were trying to do was move Black American people out of lower level positions in organizations and try and use mentorship as a process and a career development process to accelerate them through an organization. So it was used as a career acceleration tool on the premise that if you could get access to the experience and knowledge of other people in the business, then you might be able to go up the organizational ladder quickly. So basically it's got a very deep rooted history and it then became popular in the, mostly in the United States. I actually met some people who had been through American mentorship programs and become very senior people in organizations. And I met one, those put through a deliberate process actually in Coca-Cola. And then what happened is we started to use it as a, a career development tool in organizations around the world. And it was quite interesting to see how that actually evolved. But that's sort of the history of mentorship. There's other stuff we can talk about in terms of how it plays out in business. Okay. So when I think of a mentor or mentorship in general, the first thing that pops to my mind is my parents, obviously as okay. they would have been they would have been the first mentors in my life right when i think of mentorship i mean my parents taught me manners they taught me <laughs> uh, they gave me you know they educated me before i was educated by my teacher right and mm -hmm. now i am a yep. teacher here in vietnam so in a sense i'm kind of a mentor as well to the kids that i'm teaching yeah. another thing that comes to mind is like when i used to play rugby in south africa my rugby coach would have been a mentor in rugby you know help me develop mm -hmm. those skills so Nicola, I want to know from you, have you had, well, you definitely have, hmm. who have been your mentors? So who has been very influential in your life? So lots of people. I've been very fortunate, I think, to have what I would consider a series of mentors at different stages and at different ages. 
of my life. And then there's almost like a point in time where the need doesn't go away, but the role, your role starts to change and you sort of move out of mentee into mentor. So my own mentors, one started out, it was a mentor who was a, an American seminar presenter. And that was partly how I got into this industry. She, uh, her name was Deanna and she mentored me quite, a, I wouldn't say quite aggressively and not in a very negative, not, I don't mean that in a negative way, but she mentored me in a, almost like a very deliberate way and taught me so much about this industry. In fact, I still to this day think she's one of the best presenters I've ever, ever seen uh, when it comes to relaying content. And she was, she was also very generous, but she almost never told me anything if that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, that word guide, when I think of her role in my life, it was very much around guidance. It was never about telling. She wasn't teaching me things. She was showing me things. And she actually taught me there's a very big difference between your mentor and your sponsor. So someone who backs you financially doesn't have to be your mentor. And someone who's guiding you doesn't necessarily have to support you, you know, even in a career progression. A mentor is very much someone who sort of shows you the guardrails of, and keeps you on the path of where you say you want to go. So she was hugely instrumental. I then had, I met, I actually met her through him, I think, but I had a great mentor called Donald Curry and he was my boss, quite a, a character. He was a Scottish man. And also I think what he did is sort of, he believed in me at a point that I didn't always believe in myself. So he would, he would say to me, I mean, my writing skills were shocking. I don't have a great history with English, but I somehow developed this sort of ability to write press releases and articles. What he didn't know is I was, I was working like a, a demon in the background because I was worried about making a typo. I was worried about grammar and structure and I was like, I can't do this. And then I'd sort of present it. And he used to think everything took me five minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so consequently, he would give me so many opportunities to write, thinking it was taking me five minutes. But I kept producing the goods. And the articles kept being published. And eventually, over a number of years, I wouldn't say it took me five minutes, but eventually I developed and sharpened a skill that I didn't even know that I had. And that was the ability to write. Then my third mentor undoubtedly was Edward de Bono, who I fortunately got to work with. I, I got to bob around the world with Edward for a couple of years, learning all about thinking and lateral thinking and seeing the value of his methods being applied. And my intention with Edward was never to f focus on his tools as a big part of my career. But I just wanted to learn and say, well, if I traveled around with somebody in a very much a support role, I took a demotion to take that job. I took less salary. I didn't have a company car and all those different things. So I very deliberately said, let me go backwards to see if I can go forwards. It seemed to work out in the long run. It was a bit of a struggle to get back again after, <laughs> after those two years of travel. And again, Edward didn't directly teach. He, he shared knowledge and I found myself having to sort of search to get answers, but in that search, you ended up with some great conversations. And then I think perhaps one of my other mentors, and this is someone that's the Dean of a business school here in South Africa, Professor Nick Binadel. I don't even know if Nick realized that he's mentored me in an indirect way, but for a number of years, he was like a go-to for me and created lots of opportunities and would where some, in some instances when he couldn't present or facilitate, he'd encourage clients and some of his faculty to engage with me. So I can think of four in my career, Deanna, Donald, Edward, and Nick. That's awesome. And for the mm. listeners who do know Nicola and for those who don't, when she does do things such as present and uh, offer suggestions and things, and when she's at work, it does seem like a five minute thing that has uh, <laughs> not a lot of preparation behind it, but she definitely, definitely works tirelessly to present that sort of work. 
And then the other thing I wanted to chat about was I've just finished a book called Limitless by Jim Quick. Oh, cool. Have you read it? No, I haven't. Not yet. Okay. Was a very, very cool book. And there was a segment in there. There's a whole bunch. He, he, he references a lot of books and he takes a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. from other books like Atomic Habits and uh, Six Thinking Hats. Okay. And he yeah. basically oh, summarizes really? them. Yeah. And he summarizes them. He uses so, six hats. Mm. Yeah. So uh, Edward de Bono's six thinking hats are in there. And I, it's okay. just a brief summary of each one. And I kind mm -hmm. of, uh, I used our planning phase to get Think and Nick up and running. And I yeah. put, put it into those different uh, colors and into the different cool. uh, hats. And Fantastic. it's definitely, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a book that I want to read. I want to read the full Edward de Bono six thinking hats book now. After Brilliant. Reading. Yeah. Fantastic. You can come and attend one of our courses if you want. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Do you yeah. have them do you have them online? Yeah, I'm doing a webinar actually. But six hats is something that we still train actually. Okay. Yeah, cool. it's That's it's awesome. almost it found its way into a, almost everyday language, but it's still a trainable, teachable skill. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't believe I haven't trained you or interrupted your life at some point with those. I know. I remember right? doing a little bit over over dinner, I think when you were about seven, it was like a way of persuading you to clean up the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. We were using three hats. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So okay. how this whole topic came around is obviously because you, we've just spoken about your mentors and all of that knowledge is now, you know, in your brain. And now I want that knowledge or a part of it. <laughs> I want to access some of it. So, yeah. so you are now a mentor for me. But what I really want to know is why is it so important to have a mentor in your life? So I'm th I think there's almost like two camps of people. And one camp of people want mentors to come to you. It's like, I need help. And the other camp of people realize that they need help and they pursue an avenue. So if I think in my career, there were two deliberate pursuits and two came to me out of my four. So on the one side, I, th and I think the, the, the whys are slightly different. So if I take the ones that I actively pursued, what I realized is exactly in a funny way, what you're doing with me, it's like, hang on a minute. I need to learn something. I don't know enough. I. I think one of the benefits of education is you can learn from other people's experience. So when I discovered people that had experience be way beyond anything that I could do, then I, act I actively pursued that interest. I realized that I could learn something from these people. So what happened there was the relationship was initiated by me. The relationship was... I sort of identified that person, saw that there was a potential for learning and growth. I don't think it started out as a mentorship relationship. It became that over time. And I, I initiated the conversations. I initiated the meetings. I'd get time in the diary, et cetera, et cetera. The other two, now those interestingly are the two mentors that I wasn't employed by. On the other side of the fence, I had employment. I worked in organizations. So in those situations, it was almost as if there was a different interest because now you see someone on an almost day-to-day -day basis and they're obviously wanting to get something out of you too. There's a different kind of value exchange. And so there's an interest on their part for you to succeed and accelerate because it also contributes to their well-being and or profitability if you're running a business. So the business why is obviously to optimize your talent, to get the most out of your human resources and hopefully develop them in a way that they either stay with your business or become great advocates for your business going forward. On the other hand, it's almost like you see something within yourself. It's the opposite side of the same coin. And you say, I, I have got a gap there. So where can I go to fill the gap? And who can I get that information from? So today we've got Google, but what Google can't do is give you the nuances. What Google can't do is tell you the story behind the article that you might read or the video you might watch. And it's not to say don't Google for information, 
but I've always enjoyed hanging out with slightly older people and I like them to share with me their life experiences, their decisions, what was important to them on reflection, what would they have done differently? So you can't really ask Google, what would you do differently? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you touched on the value that the mentor offers to the mentee. Okay. And mm -hmm. then you also touched on that, you know, the mentor is actually also getting some sort of value out of this relationship. So uh, what, yeah. what, what exactly is the role of the, of the <clears throat> mentor and the mentee? That's a good one, actually. So I remember my first mentor, what the, the feedback she gave to me was I stretched her. So because I was so <laughs> obsessively interested in this whole industry that it's ended up being 30 years of my life, but I was fascinated that I was probably like this maniac question asker. So if we sat down and had a drink or went out for dinner, I was just constantly asking questions and I'd ask her questions that she didn't have the answers to. Yeah. <laughs> so she was like, oh, gee, no, no, I better go do some homework on that now. I better go and read that book. <laughs> And her, her reflection back to me, it's like, now I'm thinking I've got to go read that book quickly. I'm like one behind. But what she said to me is the relationship grew her. What it did is it encouraged her con to continue her own learning because now if she learned something, she want, she had someone to share it with. And she had children and a big family, but none of her children wanted to be in her industry. So it's not that they weren't interested in her job, but they were sort of more remote from her job. Um, so here she's got someone who's constantly interested in what she's doing, uh, the dec decision she's making. So in her world, I think it was she benefited because she was also growing. I think in a business world, the benefit comes from seeing other people grow so having an opportunity to witness the development of another person generally a younger person it doesn't always have to be like that but generally it is but also the contribution that they can make to your organization which is key you know the hard thing i think when you're in a business is it doesn't always have to be your boss that is your mentor it could be someone else in the business could be someone in another department. It could be someone in another division, someone in another company, if it was a group of companies. And you could even have a mentor outside of your business that knows the organization, maybe someone that was there before and has left or retired or moved on. Okay. And so if just given your experience, I mm -hmm. want to know from you, what, what are the sort of the main benefits of having a mentor like the first one that pops to my mind would be mm -hmm. direction like for me personally in my life mm -hmm. i need that sort of direction so i need i need if we're looking at our relationship mm -hmm. i'm learning so much from you i've learned so much from you in the last what i don't know my whole life really but but about think uh in the last four <laughs> weeks and one major thing was just direction i just needed something to focus on and then do it. And then, you know, when that's done, mm -hmm. give me direction onto the next thing. And it's, it's been super beneficial yeah. for getting this, you know, up and running. So, so what are the key benefits that you believe are of having a mentor are? So I like the idea of direction. I also like the idea of potential. So working with Edward, he always taught me that most people live below their level of potential. And learning how to think is almost one of the ways you access your potential. And the illustration he used to, to share is he said, if you've got a car and the engine is a thousand cc's, that's the potential of the car. The driver is the skill you need to access that potential. And he used to suggest that thinking is the skill you need to access brain power, to access your potential. So I think one of the key benefits of mentorship is this, this sense of personal growth and development. And actually it's Anthony Robbins that says that you're either growing or you're dying. 
if you're not growing, you're dying. That's what he says. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, <laughs> which is kind of true. So yes, we, we all sort of, I don't know, from the age of 11 or something, I think you're, someone said the other day, you know, the cells are going in the wrong direction, but definitely there's a midlife point where your, your ball is going downhill. Maybe there's some miracle stuff that keeps us going to a hundred these days, but there is something called midlife and you don't know when midlife is because none of us know when we're actually going to end or see the end of our life. But even when we get older, we still want to learn and grow. We still want to access potential. And sometimes even more so than when you're younger. So that feeling of making progress in your life, taking the next step, feeling like there's purpose and meaning, that you're contributing, having an impact. I think that's one of the key benefits because a mentor can sort of encourage you along that path. So it's that sense of personal growth, development. And also, if you had one of those moments when the lights have gone on, mm -hmm. you're like, ah, got it. I get it. Yeah, get it. Yeah, 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 I got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, those are often big mentorship moments where you're like, ah, it makes sense now. Interestingly, yeah. I mean, this is a bit of a, a side story. But in education... Let's say you have to take a week off because you have measles or chicken pox or flu or something, or your tonsils out or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't you don't go to work for a week. Uh, not work. Where am I? School. Yeah. <laughs> that was so long ago. <laughs> <good work. laughs> now what happens is you miss out on some content, but the school doesn't stop teaching the curricula because you missed out on that content. Mm -hmm. So invariably, over time, we, we grow up with gaps of information. Yep. And that's just a natural consequence of life. But what our brain does is the brain doesn't like a gap. It's like, oh, no, there can't be a gap. So unless you go back a week at school and you try and figure out what they said, and your brain's like, oh, no, I can't be bothered to do that. The brain just finds a way to close the gap. It closes the gap on its oh, own. Oh, really? And it starts to reconcile new incoming information. Oh, for sure. So most of us have got like sticky things going. Like it's almost like we've got some band-aids in our brain. <laughs> it's like, oh, don't know what that means. Yeah. So we'll put a little sticky label on yeah, it. Don't it, know what that means. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very interesting to me because I've literally just been teaching my students about when they're reading text. They need mm -hmm. to link that text. They need to connect it to prior experience or prior learning or link it to something they know about, of, mm -hmm. about in the world, because that's mm -hmm. how the brain, that's how the brain yep. works. It makes connections yep. to old, yep. old things and, and new yep. things. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's shocking yep. to me. I had no idea that it just, you know, closes the gap like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, Edward used to talk about sort of logical loops, but he had a great illustration for this. And he used to sit on an overhead projector and he'd have magnetic balls on the top of the projector. And he would have that magnetic ball represent a chain of information. And then he'd put another ball on the projector, which is now up on the screen. So you can see, you can see that these, these little circles and he'd drop a ball on the screen just close enough to the magnetic field of the other balls. And of course the ball just attaches and then the next one attaches yeah, yeah. and then the next one attaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen and, that before. And that was how he would, yeah, it's very clever. And that's how he would illustrate that if a new piece of information comes in, in the sort of the cognitive field of that other piece of information, it just naturally attaches. So, but if we go back to sort of finish the, the other point is when you're, you could be sitting with a mentor, but it could be happening in a seminar. It could be happening in a meeting. It could be happening over a drink with a friend in the bar after a game of rugby. Those moments are almost like creating new pathways of logic. And suddenly you go, ah, oh, geez, that's what it is. I never got that at school or I never understood that until now. And often it's just, we've, you know, we've taken the bandaid off and we've allowed the logical path to flow through. Yeah, but I think um, I think it's fairly safe to say if the brain isn't sure, it can make shit up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. All right, so we've discussed what a mentor is and the history of a mentor, mm -hmm. and we've discussed why it's important. Mm -hmm. 
But now what I really want to know from you is how do you find a mentor? And I want to ask another question on top of this, because reflecting again, going to use this as an example. I found a mentor in you because we were both interested in business. So what I really want to know is how important are the values of both parties when it comes to choosing a mentor or mentorship in general? So that's a, that's a cool question. My first mentor and myself, we were radically different people, different, completely different backgrounds, grew up in different countries, different religious influences. Not that I'm particularly religious, but very different belief systems. You couldn't get two more different people if you try. And nobody could really reconcile, including ourselves, why we got along so well. And then what happened is we did something called the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. And this was developed by someone called Ned Herman. And Ned Herman was a scientist and an artist. People can still do it now. It's called HBDI, Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. And he became curious about his own brain because he said in the world of left and right brain, it seems that the research in those days was that you would be left or right brain dominant left brain being more analytical and rational, right brain being more creative and emotional. So he wired up his kids <laughs> and gave them activities, no literally, <laughs> and started to monitor where their brain was active to see what was going on in the brain. And he did some wonderful research and it resulted in this Herman brain dominance instrument. And what we did is we completed this for fun and we actually both attended the training. So that's why we had to complete it. Okay. And when you got your report in those days, you got an overhead transparency, like a clear sheet of plastic. Oh, and it had, your, it had your brain dominance profile. Were you left or right? Were you cerebral or limbic? So you've got this like squiggle on a picture. <laughs> and it's very scientific. And I, I mean, I, I really encourage people to do this. And when we got to the training, the woman said, did you complete the, did you complete the questionnaire together? So we're like, no, <laughs> I was in South Africa and she was in America. So she said, well, this is really interesting. And she put our profiles on top of each other and you could barely tell the difference. No ways. Barely tell the difference. We both sat there and we were both equally amazed. I mean, it was like a slight little bit out on one corner and they were almost identical. So what we, that it was almost like our way of explaining that this was now why we perhaps got along. But I think when you say values, I think it would be, it's not impossible to be mentored by someone who doesn't have similar values, but it's going to be harder. It's going to be harder because if you watch Chariots of Fire, the movie, that's a, conf, that's a values conflict for somebody. And almost always your values will out when your goals. So if you've got someone who's trying to guide you and they can't help but influence you with their values, that's how we all are. You know, we've got similar values. We've got similar characteristics and uh, family values, possibly, you know, sort of the DNA of our family might have some common ground. But for me to start pushing you in a direction or encouraging you in a direction, not necessarily pushing you <laughs> and, and you're saying, oh, but I don't believe that. Now we're going to end up with a conflict. So difference is good. Difference is healthy. Difference is contributing. But in a mentorship, there's got to be some kind of chemistry. In coaching, you don't necessarily in life coaching and business coaching, which is, you know, massive now, it's a huge industry. But coaching is somewhat different to mentorship. Mentorship is a very personal experience. I don't think you can contrive it. I don't think I can go and say, I want you to be my mentor because the mentor has got to step into that role. So lots of people over the years have said, oh, will you mentor me or will you coach me? So coaching, I can say yes, but mentorship, I don't want to mentor everybody. There's just certain people that it works. The chemistry is right. And don't forget in mentorship, it's a donation of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how it works. It's a donation of time. You, you have to do it willingly, whether you're the mentor um, or the mentee. And companies have tried to put systems in place that are very deliberate. 
arguably some of them do work. But if you think of the history of mentorship, it was it was elected, it was an ask, and volunteered. Yes, I'll help you. Yeah. A bit like ours, actually. Yeah. You asked, uh, well, and I, I said, say, yes, I'll help you. <laughs> uh, uh, if, if I have to, if I have to. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, and I, I am very fortunate to have a mentor in you, and I am very appreciative of your time because I know how busy you are. Mm -hmm. So... For all the listeners out there, if you enjoyed this episode of the Think and Nick podcast, please like, comment, subscribe, share, and most importantly, interact with us. Because if you guys feel that there's a topic that you'd like to know more about, or you'd like us to discuss on the podcast, we'd love some feedback from you. And we'd love to, you know, talk about the stuff you guys want to hear about. So from me, thank you very much, Nicola, for your time. I'm Nick Daniels, your host, joined by Nicola Tyler. <laughs> Have a fantastic day, everybody. We are out. Cheers, Nick. Take care, everyone. For more news and content about Think and Nick, go to www.thinkandnick.com or visit our Facebook or Instagram pages at Think and Nick.